Uh, the structural difference between <coughs> uh, an ordinary band and a Mobius band is, of course, easy to point to. You say, here's this band, and it has two, two edges and two sides. Um, but then you can amplify that a bit by cutting it down the middle, for example. If you cut it, to, um, many of you have seen this, no doubt. But if you cut an ordinary band down the middle, what will happen? Fall into two bands, right? Because you just get two parallel structures, and they come apart. They come apart, and there you are, two. Um, if you take a Mobius band and you cut it down the middle, well, let's think before we do it. It can't come apart because the connection of it to itself through the outer edge and through the material near the outer edge is not being cut. So it must stay in one piece. That's intellectual, but, um, but then in terms of one's experience, it's still always a little startling to cut this down the middle and find that after having done so, it's still all in one piece, right? Um, and then you can play with other topological puzzles related to it, such as how much twisting will there be on it, and so on. Um, now, if, now, there are other variants of this which are quite amusing. For example, I have here um, a three-half twisted Mobius band. So you remember in the switching circuit, if you add an odd number of switches, then it will be Mobius, right? It will have one edge. Odd number of uh, twists, half twists, it has one edge. So once again, this cannot fall apart when I cut it down the middle. But what will happen to it is going to be a little different. And you might not predict what will happen to it. Anybody have an idea what will happen to it? Well, while you're thinking, I'll tell you a story. Um, the, first, uh, the first story, uh, science fiction story, I think I ever read was by Martin Gardner, uh, who used to write the Scientific American column, Mathematical Games, and passed away just recently. Wrote many, many, many books on uh, mathematics and philosophy. Um, but he wrote a science fiction story, which I read when I was a kid. Um, and in the science fiction story, there's a group of mathematicians who are meeting in Chicago in a hotel. And, um, and one of them um, is named Slapernowski, and another one is named Robert somebody. I forgot his last name. Um, and Slapernowski gets up and he gives a talk, and he explains that he's discovered a method by which he can um, send an ordinary object into the fourth dimension by... Um, by appropriately twisting it and folding it on itself, and then it disappears. Um, and uh, then he um, demonstrates it with a piece of paper, twists the piece of paper, and it goes pop and disappears into the fourth dimension. And Robert is um, quite angry with him for this because he regards this as flummery um, and, um, and just magic tricks and is not willing to believe that anything has really happened here. Uh, and... Um, Slapernowski gets very upset and, um, and uh, grabs Robert and twists him into the same form as, uh, as the piece of paper. And Robert disappears into the fourth dimension. Uh, and then Slapernowski starts to get quite upset because he doesn't know how to bring him back. So as a last resort, he twists himself into the same form and disappears. And now the, now the assembled mathematicians are quite puzzled, having had the, these two luminaries disappear from the room. Um, and they don't know what to do, and for a while nothing happens. And then they hear a great commotion from downstairs, and it seems that both of the men have fallen into the middle of a burlesque show from the fourth dimension into the show that is going on downstairs. And so it ends well, if a bit chaotically. That's the story that I liked when I was a kid. Um, so anyway, have you figured out what will happen to this uh, three-half twisted Mobius band if I cut it down the middle? It could be that it jumps into the fourth dimension, but I haven't had it do that recently. Let's try it and find out.
It comes out nodded. I'll pass it around. Here's another Escher. Uh, more ag- uh, um, a little more agony in this, uh, in this one than in the snake that bites its tail because the dragon is trying to get out of the page, it would seem. Um, and here's one um, that has a certain emotion associated with it, but I, it's a kind of a dark emotion, but I don't know exactly what emotion it is. It uh, wasn't intended emotionally, I don't suppose. Um, it's a drawing of the famous Alexander Horn sphere, an example in topology, uh, the, this fractal two-dimensional surface which keeps on hooking around itself forever in an infinite form um, is still a sphere, a two-dimensional sphere embedded in three-dimensional space. But if you were to hook a lasso around it, there would be no way to get the lasso off. One says that the complement of the sphere is non-simply connected. But fractals have emotional modalities. There's no question about it. And um, I don't know anything about it. I mean, except my own perceptions. Um, we're still going through some imagery here. Um, this is John Wheeler's universe. John Wheeler is a well-known relativist, general relativist, also the thesis advisor of Richard Feynman. Um, and he used to draw this um, lovely U. It's a U. Um, and the Big Bang is supposed to occur over here. And then the universe expands. And eventually, in the physicist's cosmology, becomes capable of observing itself. And what does it observe but the information from the Big Bang, the residue of the Big Bang, the background radiation? But from the point of view of quantum mechanics, this is a kind of a self-referential paradox because in quantum mechanics, it is an orthodoxy that a phenomenon does not become actual until it is observed. And if you uh, regard the universe as not capable of coming to observation until much later, then how do you say what the actuality of the universe was before the universe managed to observe its own origins. So he liked to point that out. And I've modified it a little bit here. Um, you could try to make an allegory out of that in that um, in that the, this diagram indicates that there is some kind of metastructure involved in the universe, which is actually part of the universe and its relationship to, to what? It's my problem about knots for cybernetics purposes, because a knot is, a, is an entity unto itself, which acquires its nodding in relationship to how it is embedded in something else, three-dimensional space. Um, the knot would not be knotted if it were not in relationship to the space. So the knot must have its own space. And if you're thinking of an observing system or an observer or yourself, you might say that you created your own space. You could take it on that you created your own space and ask, in what sense is the space my own creation? Um, and then that space is also part of the universe. But it's an open question of a cybernetic kind, similar but slightly different from Wheeler's question. Wheeler says, how could it possibly be observing something that didn't really exist when it was only a possibility. What kind of a creation is that? And the cybernetic question is, how does the space arise 
in which the observation occurs. But both of those are answered by Heisenberg. Pardon me? Both of those are answered by Heisenberg. Uh, are both of those answered by Heisenberg? Well, the, the observer actually changes the, what he's observing. Uh, well, that, that is a gloss. That is one gloss on Heisenberg to say that the observer affects the observed, yes. But, um, but uh, in point of fact, it isn't quite as simple as just that the observer affects the observed. Um, it's that what is available is a, in quantum mechanics, I mean, and what is available is a superposition of possibilities, and the observer ends up with one of them. Brings one into reality. Yeah. Um, and the others go away. But how did that happen? That's so, Schrodinger's cat. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. right. So Schrodinger's cat is a puzzle for Heisenberg's observer. Anyway, um, I'm juxtaposing here the cybernetic question of how is it that the observer brings forth the space that he observes, which he does to a large degree if we're thinking cybernetically, and is that enough? And it's similar to the Wheeler question. It's not the same question. And here's an abstraction of the knotted situation. Now I have nothing but a line which goes underneath itself. Um, and the underneath itself is the self-relationship. Um, and it is depicted, um, it is indeed depicted in a plane which could be further regarded as a three-dimensional space. But I'm abstracting now and trying to just reach something uh, that is related to itself. So, uh, so I'm going to use a convention. Oops, not that convention. Oh, I jumped. And it's probably a good idea. So let's stay with this for a moment, and then I will jump. Um, so I'm going to have a line with a, with a name and another line with a name. And I shall say that this line, which goes underneath this one by convention of drawing, is a member of the other one. In the set theoretic idea, you just have the abstraction. Something is a member of something else. There's no need for having a space, much of a space, just the idea of membership. Once you create a collection, you create a space, but it's a very rudimentary space. You, know, you have collected up some things and said, these three chairs, right? I haven't talked about the fact that this one is close to that one or that there are chairs other than that there are three. Um, very rudimentary. And here I have the, the set consisting of omega, but, but omega is labeled and uh, finds itself belonging to itself. And so omega belongs to omega. And this is a picture of a set which is a member of itself. A picture of a set which is a member of itself. Now, I did want to use the slide that, that um, but I thought since we were looking at that, I should show you this. So, so now I'm, I'm going to talk about sets, a very abstract mathematical idea, just membership, an asymmetry. That's all you have. Something is a member of something else. It isn't given that if A is a member of B, that B will be a member of A. Could be, but, but it isn't given. Um, and one has the notion of, of, of embracing certain distinctions and bringing them together into a set. Um, well, uh, we could diagram it in an unusual way from the point of view of the usual diagrams uh, by letting, the, letting a continuous line denote the overset and a broken line denote the under, underset, the one that's a member of the overset. So A is a member of B. And then that curl that you saw before is a set which is a member of itself. Sets which are members of themselves are in the same category of reflexivity as the other things we've been talking about. Um, very abstract piece of reflexivity there. Now, let me back up uh, and see what we have here. Ah, there it is. I knew it was in there somewhere. Okay. Um, 
That's the Escher drawing I had in mind. Okay. How many people have seen this before? I think it's a very famous drawing. You, know, you don't have to. I think a lot of people have seen it. But, but look at it again. Um, you see it's got three half twists. Each, there's a half twist and a half twist and a half twist. And it's got some decorative cuts. And then it's been carefully sliced down the middle. And then if you look at it, you see that indeed it's, um, it's just a trefoil knot, just like this trefoil knot, you see? Going around itself like that and looping through itself. There's a loop, and here's another loop, and so on. So that's what we saw when we cut that piece of paper down the middle. Consequences of the twist. But let's go on with these knot sets. In order to do that, I, I want to... Um, remind you of a couple of things. Uh, one is, um, what might not be a reminder, but knots can be represented by pictures. Um, like, like these fragments of pictures, which show over and uh, over crossing of two like this, or a line under crossing another line like that. These little pictures are quite useful to us um, because we can compress a lot of information about some weaving into the picture. So I would draw a diagram like this to indicate the trefoil knot. And a similar diagram will indicate something else. Now this diagram is almost the same as that one, except that uh, this crossing has been switched from over to under. But in this diagram, you see that the second move that's illustrated there can be applied, and then the first move can be applied, and this one became unknotted, where unknotted means that the picture could be manipulated until it turned into the unknotted circle, like that. Um, whereas this one, will, it will never happen, but we'll come to that later, how uh, one decides such a thing. Um, um, here is... Um, a link of two components, two circles that are linking through one another. Um, these diagrams are very minimal, um, and they can be made even more minimal and abstract if one wants to. For example, I could label, just as a digression, I could label the three places where the crossings occur, and then I could take a walk and, um, and, uh, and encamp what I see. So I see going over one, and then going under two, and then going over three, and then going under one, and then going over two, and then going under three, and I'm back to where I started. Over one, under two, over three, under one, over two, under three, and I'm back where I started. And this abstract code is actually enough. Not very visualizable, but it works. So, so, um, so one is close to having removed the and one is close to having removed the outer space in which it can be interpreted and just talked about how it is in relation to itself, where the in relation to itself, in this case, is in the coding, where there are pairs of, uh, of cross, uh, the crossings occur paired, one and two and three, and how they occur in relation to themselves is occurring in terms of the sequence and in terms of the over and under. So it is possible to, to kind of intrinsically describe it, and then find a space in which it lives. So that's uh, the way those sorts of things get answered in the combinatorics. And these diagrams are useful um, to the knot theorist who wants to take an abstract but more complex uh, version that has geometry and turn it into a diagram, or uh, to the person who might be studying knotted DNA um, and makes a diagram out of the electron micrograph, which represents the DNA molecule. You would want to diagram that and see what the structure of it was. Is it knotted? It is. And in the case of this electron micrograph, it was sufficiently clear so that people could see that it went over here and under there and over here and under there and so on. A uh, very difficult technique to get the micrographs into that level of quality. Oh, but there are three moves. And um, 
these three moves are enough to generate the topology. Um, so if you're dealing with knots in terms of diagrams, then all you need are these three moves, removing a curl or adding it. Um, if two lines, if a line goes doubly over another bit, then you can pull it apart. And the triangle move, which is a, is, which is a, a little bit of non-weave, right? A woven triangle is more interesting than an unwoven triangle, but I drew a woven triangle. Here would be um, under, over. No, sorry. What am I doing? There. All right? A little triangle like that is woven and it can't move very much. But, but this triangle here isn't woven and you can, you can slide that line around or you can slide this line around. So those move, that move is available to you without changing the rest of the picture. So then you have these graphs and you can make those moves on them. And if two knots are topologically the same, you can get from one to the other by a series of these moves. Not obvious, but it's true. If they're topologically the same in three dimensions, then you can get from one to the other by these moves. We'll come back to this. But we're talking about sets. And if we diagram sets in this form, then here's that set, not drawn so beautifully, that is a member of itself, exactly by the convention I made. And, and here's a pair of sets that are mutual to one another. A, is, a has B as its member, and B has A as its member. These sets are illegal in the usual set theory that you learned in school. Um, they're called non-well-founded. Um, sets are not supposed to have infinite descending chains of membership. Um, illegal doesn't mean uh, violating, uh, uh, I mean, you're not going to be picked up by the police. It's just that they're illegal because the axioms don't allow it, and you would be using a different axiom system for set theory if you had this. This is non-well-founded. Um, so, um, but, these, but this model shows you that, um, that it's okay. Um, you can do that. Um, other ways of thinking show that it's okay as well. Um, sets that are members of themselves. Um, philosophically, sets that are members of themselves are always around. Can you think of a set that's a member of itself? Well, the set of ideas, for example, is an idea. And as soon as we start talking about things cybernetic, um, you're in this kind of domain. You're thinking about understanding, understanding, or the cybernetics of cybernetics. As soon as you are in that reflexivity, then, um, then it would be natural to have sets that are members of themselves, like the set of ideas um, or the set of concepts. Um, There is a question about what is the relationship between a self-membership like that and something like the set of ideas. And then it's a metaphor, right? Um, if you think about the set of ideas, it's certainly an idea. But when you went through that cognitive turn to understand that this collection of ideas is itself an idea, you kind of folded what you were looking at underneath into itself, right? You did that in order to get there. So, uh, so the so the diagram, in its continu in its relationship of continuity and discreteness, has metaphorically some relationship with what you do when you think of um, something more philosophical that is a member of itself. I believe. In any case, we're going to explore this set theory for a few minutes. So, first of all, here's something standard. Here's the empty set. See, it has no members. It's entirely underneath. This is very architectural. The next, or hierarchical, I shouldn't identify architecture with hierarchy, but it's hierarchical. Um, here's one, which, who, which has only one member, namely zero. And two, has two members, namely 0 and 1. And 3 has three members, namely 0, 1, and 2. 
That, of course, four has four members, zero, one, two, and three, and so on. Um, and this is a way, this is the usual way that people construct sets with an appropriate number of members, starting from nothing. You can start from nothing and form the set zero, which will, uh, the, the empty set has no members, then the set consisting of the empty set has one member, and so on. Yeah? Minus one? Oh, well, you have to make an extra construction for minus one. Um, you know, in, in this diagrammatic, I might decide to write everything to the left to represent minus one. Um, but minus one is certainly an extra, extra construction. Um, it could be that, um, uh, unconsciously at least, uh, the resistance to having negative numbers had to do with the very palpable existence of positive numbers one stick, two sticks, three sticks, or one, one mark, two marks, three marks. And um, it was hard for people to add some extra distinction that they would call would minus stick. numbers. What? I'm sorry? Someone owes me a stick. Someone owes me a stick is a good interpretation. Um, on the other hand, I can't resist showing you, I should have a movie for it, um, that topologically, um, we could have a one and a minus one appear out of nothing. But in order to do it, I guess, let me see, let me see. How are we going to do this in the air? Let me do it on the table and then see if I can figure out how to do it in the air. Those of you who were nearby saw me produce two curls out of no curl at all by continuous motion. Um, but it, but it, it requires the frame of the plane in order to be stabilized. I'll try it in the air. This, I, I fold the loop on itself like this, so there's some implicit self-reference involved. Then this slides up, and this slides in behind that, and this little curl goes this way and the other curl goes the other way. And, and, a, and a positive and a negative curl have been produced out of nothing uh, continuously. Yeah. So you could have negative and positive curls, um, but they need some background to stabilize them. Otherwise, they're just curls. So negative and positive entities arise naturally in geometry and topology. But as far as numbers were concerned, it wasn't until I guess about the 1600s that people started to accept negative numbers. Yeah, if you think about it, you, you, you know, I mean, it's true that from a mathematical perspective, people were resistant to allowing negative numbers for a long time. But the people who kept accounts, the people who lent and borrowed money, uh, I mean, who lent money and, and, and so on, uh, uh, those people, of course, kept, uh, kept ledgers where it was what was owed and what was... Uh, and and so and so that uh, negative numbers were implicit in in people's calculations for for forever. But but still um, the the idea that um, uh, an absence could be an entity is still uh, a little startling, right? When it comes up again, it looks startling. When it comes up in Dirac's vacuum, where absences of particles that leave the Dirac sea become there are antiparticles in the Dirac sea, right? Uh, uh, then the, the, active, the active absence becomes an entity that's uh, still a little startling to us, right? That's physical existence of negatives, antiparticles. So, so I, I'm not, not sure we've gotten completely used to negative numbers, but very used to them. But the process doesn't stop. We, we could continue the process, you see. Um, I could go on for forever, and then at the end, I have an infinite row of, um, of vertical lines. And then I could collect them all up, and I get the net first infinite number. You can imagine going on in the process into the transfinite, if you want to, in this notation. It might help. Um, oh, there it is again. Um, but I think I said everything I wanted to say about it, except perhaps about the continuous transition. Because, you see, if you, if you look at this, it, it is a continuous model. And in the model, here you are the container. And then you begin a journey in which 
it is not obvious whether you are a container or a contained or just on a journey, but eventually you arrive and become, a, become the contained. So you go, in this metaphor, you go from being the container through a continuity into, an, into a kind of an ambiguous place, and then you end up being the contained. And here, you're neither the container nor the contained, you're just omega. But over here, you are quite articulately omega, that is, its own member. Sorry? Uh, what does it, uh, this epsilon mean? It's belonging epsilon to the Epsilon means set. membership, right. Membership, not belonging to the set, because it's... It means belonging to the set, uh, yes. no one set can belong to itself. Ah, that's, yeah, so you, you just expressed the axiom that a set does not belong to itself. Yes. But I'm saying that I have a notion of membership uh, or belonging, and that in this non-standard theory, a set could belong to itself. And that this goes back to, this goes back before people were worried about the paradoxes of such things to certain kinds of sets which any philosopher might think about or any cyberneticist might think about, such as the, the set of ideas, right? The set of ideas is an idea. Um, and so belongs to itself. Uh -huh. uh, so it, it has been pointed out by many people, or a few people anyway, that it is not necessarily the problem with the paradoxes that sets can't be members of themselves. It was the idea of Russell and certain other people that we should forbid self-membership uh, because that would be one way of avoiding the famous Russell paradox of the set of sets that are not members of themselves but that other ways of handling this can be used, uh, such as ta taking care with the use of the word all. You said that uh, be member something uh, like uh, be part of set. Is it the same? Oh, well, such uh, as? Uh, does it mean that A is a... Uh, no, not a subset. No, I, I don't mean subset. And I do keep the same distinction that is... Um, the usual one between subset and let's remind ourselves A, a subset of B means that if A is a member of A then A is a member of B all right, and this is this is a relation which is based upon the notion of membership, and one thinks of A as the members of A. So that's the in, that's the notion, right? That a set is a co is a collecting up of its members. The members are uh, certain entities. Um, it could be that a set is a member of itself, as in my model, or as in the set of ideas. So I juxtapose those two because you may think, ah, yes, well, something like the set of ideas is for philosophers, and mathematicians don't deal with sets like that. So mathematicians don't have to deal with sets that are members of themselves. Um, but on the other hand, um, if I decided to make a non-standard set theory, then, um, then it, would be, it could be as simple as that, and I would have a set that is a member of itself. Another person who had this idea um, and wrote a book about it is a man named Axel. I may be misspelling this because there's a popular math writer also with a similar name, so I, I may have this name wrong. But Axel uses the following notation. Here's an A and here's a B, and an arrow from A to B means that A belongs to B. Uh, membership um, is an asymmetrical relation. Um, and then omega, for him, is simply 
something with an arrow pointing back to itself. And then omega is a member of omega. That's it. So mutuality and uh, self-membership are to be, here I'm, I'm suggesting we can explore them, and then we're looking at the reflexivity of the situation. But, but how does it end up looking if we follow the metaphor in this direction using this notation? That's the question. Yeah. Luke, can I just ask you something about um, the diagram up there? Uh, you said you are traveling here and you cross under where you were. Uh, Didn't I? Right? Yeah. That's or I could have said omega is traveling. Oh, you actually said you. I did. Yeah. Right. So, and I think it is highlights something which is important to me. The way you're describing this, it has nothing to do with being part of that system. It has to do with making distinctions about that system as an observed object that you're doing yourself. If I'm yes. on that line and following it, what I see is a track that I follow or something like that. That's right. And I don't see any crossing because I'm just following a track. Yeah, yeah, you have to, it, it has maybe. to be, it has so. to be just like a knot. It has to be embedded in that space in such a way that a crossing is detectable. So an observer, an observer walking the line can look down, if you imagine him looking down, and find out whether there are any points below him. Yeah, but it might be just a tube that you're walking around inside. So it's a pipe. Yeah, yeah. I'm walking I, around inside the pipe, and what I do is I... I agree. So, so as far as self-reference is concerned, it's very malleable, isn't it? You see, you, if you're looking straight down, you will find the point where it lies underneath itself. You'll find the crossing. But if... That's only if the thing itself... I, I know, I know, right. You could look either side of it. Right, but, but even so, um, let's say we, t we make a closed loop. Oh, I have a nice closed loop here somewhere. Nice closed loop, right. Now... This closed loop would not be regarded as being a member of itself, no matter how you look at it, from the point of view of that external observer. He doesn't say it's a, right? But this one, this one, the external observer looking at it this way says, oh, it's a member of itself. But looking at it this way doesn't say it's a member of itself. So it requires a particular way of looking in order to become a member of itself in this model. Yeah. All that's fine because the diagrams are always particular ways of looking, but if you go up into three dimensions with them, then suddenly self-membership becomes very malleable. It, it could be a member of itself or not, depending on how you look at it. I like but, that. But there's also the difference that if you were in that, yes. so if you were traveling in that, Yes. I have no idea. If I'm traveling in that and I, and I never get to look outside to see yeah. what I'm nearby, yeah. oh, then I, then I wouldn't know I was knotted. I wouldn't, know, I wouldn't know I was linked with the other. So, so all of this is relational. The external observer rather than the internal. That's right. So it's all being talked about from the point of view of an external observer. Yeah. That's right. I just wanted to it certainly check is. That out. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, can't quite hear you. Let me come over. What is the meaning of the arrow? The arrow. The arrow. Oh, that's a different notation. Um, but the arrow, the arrow, that's Axel's arrow, and and he he indicates membership by an arrow. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, from a cognitive point of view, uh, we have the same uh, schema and uh, the same figure with uh, E to D, but with a link between uh, E and D. An asymmetrical, uh, an asymmetrical and link between. On e. And here it is. E, D, 
V, which belongs to oh, the oh, 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 let me, let me, okay, so let's use Axel's notation and talk about it for a moment. Okay, so A is the set whose members are 1, 2, and 3, yeah? And B is the set whose members are 1 and 2. Now, how would it be an axle? Well, you would have A, and you would have 1 and 2 and 3, and there would be arrows that go from 1, 2, and 3 to A. That's the same. That's what axle would write instead of this, yeah? And... Um, and here's B. B is a node which if you investigate, I'll put circles around those so they become nodes. Um, if you in, so what you do to find out what are the members of a given node you have some node, and there are various lines that go into it. There may be lines that go out of it as well. I'm, I'm segregating them a little bit so it's easier to see, right? So you look at the node, and you look at all the lines that go into it, and that is the set that that node is, yeah? Now, if, if some sub-collection of, the, of these nodes go over to another node, then that guy is said to be a subset of this guy. That's what subset means. So, so, subset, so subset doesn't mean the same thing as membership at all. Yeah. For me, it is not a subset. It is a motion in all. There are links between two interfaces. Yeah. It is only a link between with the origin toward B. And no, I, I agree that if A is a subset of B, then you might well think no, of the... No, it's not a subset. It is a link between two and two, not two subsets. But if, if you it's have... Wait, wait. wait. If, you have, if you have one set is a subset of another, then you might well diagram it. You might well diagram it by saying that there's a kind of an arrow that goes from one to the other. There is a functional arrow that goes from one to the other. It interferes with Axel's arrow um, a little bit. Yeah, I right. understand, but um, we have to, to have a, a perhaps more complicated link to have a true subset. Because uh, first we have only links between A and B, and after, in another time, a link between B and a part of E, perhaps to have a subset. If not, uh, uh, a relation between, uh, uh, I understand a set as a class, okay? As a, a class. Uh, a yeah, of, yes, uh, a, set, a set is a class a of elements, uh, and but and but but here, what you what, here, but I'm but I'm speaking in a, I'm speaking in a language which says that the key to whether something is in a set or not is represented by epsilon. Epsilon, the epsilon relation tells you whether one thing is a member of the other, whether it's in the class or not. Right. Yeah. So where do we go? In uh, Langacan, cognitive linguistics, first we have a relation between A and B uh, with a focalization from E and the link in link toward B. And it is not a, a set, a true set, it is a part, a, an aggregate, in fact. Well, you can make extra distinctions, but I, I don't think we should try to argue about the use of Axel's notation because it wasn't mine. Yeah. Yeah. 
But you understand, it wasn't my intent to discuss Axel's notation. So, um, so, uh, and 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 what I am saying is that if you want to make a an alternate kind of set theory, one way to start is to redefine the membership relation in a different way, and that's what I'm doing. Okay. Um, and then you can compare that with the membership relation you're used to. Yes, but uh, it is uh, uh, it intervenes in uh, the construction of a set or, or of a subset, like an aggregate. It is an aggregate. Well, um, I think I think we'll, we're probably just going to have to discuss this afterwards at yeah. more length because there are some distinctions that we're each making that are slightly different, and we have to sort them out. It, 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 it isn't going to get sorted out here. Yeah. Let's talk about it afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. One of the problems I'm having with this is that it all seems very arbitrary. For example, if you go back to Spencer Brown's notation, you can say, okay. The mark means a call or it means a cross. And I'm never quite sure why I should call it a call one time and why I should call it a cross another time. Um, would you like me to speak to that or are you speaking to this now? Uh, well, let me give you several things to respond to. Okay. Because it's all it has to do with arbitrariness. Okay. So let's take these two figures here. I don't know whether you want us to think of these as a two-dimensional drawing or as a three-dimensional drawing. For example, when I look at the one... Well, you have to let me answer some of the questions while you ask them or else we'll all forget what the questions are. Okay. So let me, ask, let me say something about that one. Okay. They are two-dimensional drawings, They're but two one is allowed to move from one kind of two-dimensional drawing to another in the knot theory. This slide I hadn't started to discuss yet. In the knot theory, I would be allowed to move from the left drawing to the right drawing because it's the same as untwisting the twist in space. But you see, I don't need to untwist it. All I need to do is to move. In other words, if I look at this thing from this direction, I can imagine a rubber band that has a sort of loop. But then if I move over to this side... Yes, that's exactly what I was saying to Ranulph a few minutes ago uh -huh. with the loop. I said, look at this loop. If you look at it this way, it's got a twist in it, and it, we would say it's a member of itself. But if I turn, you don't see the twist, and, and the observer would say there's not, it's not a member of itself. The, the three moves that I put on the board, the removal and putting in of a twist, right. the slide, and right. the triangle move, right. they are moves on the graphs, on the two-dimensional pictures, which completely capture, as far as topology is concerned, everything that you can do in three-dimensional space. So the moves are worth looking at because then we don't have to think about three-dimensional space to look at uh, everything that goes on. For example, if I have uh, a set like this, A is a member of B and B is a member of A, there is no way that you can move around it and get rid of that, you see? Um, and there's no way you can use my moves to get rid of it. It has much more persistence of being mutually self-referential than pure self-reference. It has much more persistence in being mutually self-referential. It has a topological okay. persistence okay. to being mutual. Okay. Mutuality is more persistent than, uh, than just pure self-reference in, okay. in this way of looking. Pure self-reference is a throwaway in this system. But mutuality is not a throwaway. What is a throwaway? A throwaway, <laughs> I, what I mean is you can't get rid, by, make, by taking a different point of view, yeah, yeah. you can't get rid of the mutuality okay. so easily in this system. Okay. It stays around. The self-reference is a toss-up. It depends on how you look at it, okay. um, always. Okay. So I took that as an interesting moral that this system talks to me and says, it shouldn't take self-reference too seriously, but mutual mutuality and linkage is more serious. Now I'd like your assistance. <laughs> now make it fit. Now just just hold one of these ropes in one hand and the other in the other, 
one below the other so that people can see. Very good. Great. Now, this is a topologically rather prosaic uh, illustration of zero. <laughs> this is zero. Now, this is one. And this is two. And this is three. The, the number of twists, all right? And this would be adding minus one, adding minus two. And this would be twisting around the other way, negative one, negative two. So here's negative two. And, and if I were to add to negative two twice, two added to negative two, if we were to let this go, it becomes zero. So the zero in this case, in the case of this physical topological system, is a certain state of the system that's zero, called zero, the reference point around which we can make positive and negative numbers. So um, zero can often be a reference point. My, thank you. Can we just leave those like that? Um, I'd yeah. like to point out to you that this is the Women's World High Jump Championship record, and this is the men. <laughs> <laughs> so zero can be a reference point uh, that's physical. But maybe you would like an some kind of a more absolute notion of what is zero. Th these are just a couple more pictures of what it would look like if you take something which is um, a nice linkage, a chain link like that, and then you see what kind of um, relations it turns into like that. A has as its member B, but B is a member of A, and it's also a member of C, and that's part of the linkage, and it goes on down the line. The Borromean rings, misspelled there, uh, I think, it should have only one M. One R? Oh, well, anyway, it's misspelled. Too many repetitions of letters. But too many repetitions of letters in the thing as well. Um, this is a, an interesting link. If you removed A, then B and C come apart, right? You can see it. Remove any one of them, and the other two come apart. It was the, years ago, it used to be the, the sign for Ballantine beer. Um, and, um, and so each one occurs twice. A is over B twice. It goes over B here, and then it goes over B again. Um, and A is over B, and B is over C, and C is over A. So that's the weaving of it. But, um, but as far as our sets are concerned, it's a little strange to have a repetition. They're multi-sets. An element could occur more than once. And then we have to handle them. And um, there's some problem about how you would handle them, but I don't want to dwell on it. I want to show you another example. Here's the weaving triangle over here, a woven triangle. And if you just thought of each of these as representing a set, then you see A is over B, and B is over C, and C is over A. And so the, the wovenness of the triangle is represented in terms of the mutuality of the sets by a has as its member B, B has as its member C, but C has as its member A, and you come round. The weaving of that is described by this circularity. So what looks like uh, some illegal sets is nothing more than a simple weaving pattern. Um, and then... This is what I meant about the problem of the repetition or the interest of the repetition. You see, if something is repeated twice in a set, it might be repeated twice in this very simple way that it's just a circle right in front of another circle, and it repeats twice, and they can be slid apart. So what will we do? And I tell you my choice, but you might have a different idea. My choice is that if you have two elements of a set that are the same, they're allowed to cancel each other out. So this is not the usual rule at all. This is annihilation. Two, two elements that are the same can disappear together. Yeah. What about
about cardinality? Yeah, well, you, you have to ask, what is the cardinality of a minimal version of it? Or, what is the card, uh, otherwise it doesn't have a cardinality. Yeah, so, incidence, uh, yeah. Form, yeah, you can talk about the minimal version of it, where you can, but it's the same with, um, it's the same with ordinary sets, it's just the way you get a minimal version is a little different. In ordinary set theory, if I have the set consisting of one and one and two, this is usual, then this is just a set consisting of one and two, and the cardinality is two, not three. Okay, what you do in usual set theory is that if you have multiplicity, if you have a multiple representatives of an element, it's just regarded as one element, one representative of it. That's the usual rule. That's how you get cardinality. Here, you cancel them in pairs and get down to a minimal one, and then you have cardinality again but you have to minimize. Does that satisfy you? You might not like my canceling rule. Yeah. You can always make a new set out of the previous sets that you've created. Is that what you're talking about? That are also all included in the sets that you find. Well, right. So that's what I was talking about before. Let's put it up here. That you can start with the empty set, and then you can form the set, where this is the set with no members. Then you can form the set one, which, can, which is the set whose member is the empty set. Then you can form the set two, which is the set whose member is the empty set, and one, and three. You can go on forever with this, right? You can always form one more set by forming the set of things that you've already created. And this goes on ad infinitum, even to infinite sets. If you've created all the sets you think you have, you can always put them in a big collection and make one more. So you never end. Then you say that set also contains itself. So if you imagine that you could create all sets, then it would have to be a member of itself. All sets has its logical difficulties, but it has to be a member of itself because of the way in which we made things. Yeah. So what people often do is they make a distinction between set and class. And then you can have the class of all sets. And then you don't run into the logical problem. Uh, that it presents. But there is always, in processes of collecting or other processes, there's always this temporality that you've, you have a method of creating something, and then, having created it, you can apply that same method, and so you get to keep on creating. And numbers and sets are like that. So then, it's very difficult to have all of them, because as soon as you go to all, you feel like taking that and creating something with it. You're jumping in and out of the system. And uh, so that same theme that, we, that has come up from a number of you and, and me and, and everyone else is how could you be both inside and outside at the same time? You, uh, it's not, uh, not something that is easy to describe logically. Or how can you be in more than one place at the same time? And uh, the physicist's answer is um, curious because it, it has to do with um, certain actual phenomena, right? In the, in the quantum mechanical model, you don't really say that the electron is in more than one, one place in the atom at any given time. What you say is that it's in a superposition. Um, but the fact that it's in a superposition, which corresponds to, be, corresponds to a multiplicity of places, is quite different from being in a definite place, entirely different physically um, and handled differently. Uh, and has different consequences. So there's, there's a kind of hint of being in more than one place at the same time that happens in, in our physical descriptions. But it may not be the only solution to how can you be in more than one place at the same time. Yeah, the, the question of where something is in physics turns into a different question 
it turns into the question, what did you observe here? And usually for the physicist, the here is more or less well-defined for him because the observations are, are, are made in relation to macroscopic domain where the here is uh, a well-defined sort of thing or repeatable, right? But it isn't a question of, is there an electron here? The question is, did an event occur here? Was something, was an event occurred here? Um, whereas, where, whereas when you deal with something like this, you can, since it, since it has a, a, a certain ex, extra stability of behavior in relation to an electron, I can say it's here, All right? It's not somewhere else. It's a, it's, for us, it's an eigenform if I'm thinking cybernetically, and for the physicists, it's an eigenstate. I'm not sure I'm answering a question or, or just talking at this point. Um, but are, are, we, um, are we getting lost in this? Maybe a little bit. I was making a, a logical point about the sets. Let me finish my sentence about it. That you see, if I do allow this rule, which is different from the usual rule, of canceling in pairs, then, um, then a lot of the knots go away because they just don't live um, in any description that has much substance. But the links that we had before, like, like these, sometimes go away and sometimes they don't. The one on the top just doesn't go away any more than the mutually linked parts go, uh, stay. They stay even if we allow, and what are we going to allow? We're going to allow you to draw a diagram and then make it out of rope, and then toss it up in the air and then put it back down in the plane in some way or other. Um, and uh, a large number of these sets survive that topological um, translation. They can be made into topology and they still have the same relations that they had before when you put them back down, when you allow this kind of continuous translation of of one version of it into another. And then the external observer of them has disappeared a little bit. It isn't so dependent on the external observer. But one of the things that goes away when you do that is self-reference. Sets can be members of themselves if you like or not members of themselves, doesn't matter. Um, but other things like this mutual linking um, uh, hang around. But some links, um, some links like this one, um, are not seen by this theory. It's a very weak topological theory, but it has something to recommend it for thinking about these issues about reflexivity. So that's my story about the knot sets. And um, we're, we're moving towards the end, so I, I don't think we need to force the knot sets any further. It was one story I wanted to tell you about. There's one more story I kind of wanted to tell you. There's actually more than one, and but we, we're going to get too tired. Um, but this one has to do with self-reference in language. And I'm isolating here two operations that I think we do a lot. Um, and one of them is naming. You have something, and it acquires a name. And the other one has to do with what happens when you're introduced to someone. So, for example, if I was introduced to Ranulf, and he said, this is Ranulf, and I shook hands with Ranulf, and I paid attention, then the next time I see him, he's Ranulf, right? Um, and his name is over there with him for me. My observer puts his name with him, doesn't put a blank over there. Sometimes you meet someone and you forgot their name and then it's a little bit 
peculiar because you know that the name ought to be over there with them, but you don't know what the name is. Um, so there's a shift operation uh, that you do, um, and that operation is that someone tells you um, A is the name of B, and you say yes, A is the name of AB, and you see him as AB the next time, and you know it's his name, and so there's a little marker back in your mind, which isn't uh, probably written down exactly, but it's somewhere in there, that has this relationship fused like that. So the name you give him is not just an abstract name, it's the name of the person whose name is A, like that. The computer is telling us that it's time to quit. You see that flickering? Yeah. Um, so, um, so it's like this. His name is Heinz, um, and it gets shifted like that. And then uh, I don't see the tag, but it's, it's there virtually. So what happens if these kind of operations are being concatenated in a system? You have a system which does this. Um, you, you make names for things. And you also project structures to the um, apparent things that you observe so that by the time you've grown up uh, sufficiently, you look at anything, and there's just this enormous um, uh, uh, base of, um, of, uh, of uh, already given uh, material over there with that object in the apparent space. All sorts of things are over there now, not just the name of the person, but any object. And, uh, and that it's a chair, and that it's blue, and that it has a round uh, shape, and on all sorts of associations, they're all over there with it, shifted over there. You do that all the time. Um, and you could imagine that at the beginning, there was no notion of, um, of a self-reference involved in the system, but just in the formalism of what I gave you, self-reference will arise. It, it arises automatically. For example, if you started out with, not, now I'm doing mathematics again, if nothing refers to nothing, then by shifting it, you have sharp applied to nothing refers to nothing. And then by shifting it again, you have sharp applied to sharp refers to sharp, since the name went over on the right. And then by shifting it one more time, you have three sharps apply, refers to three sharps, and self-reference occurred. That one was a little too abstract. Let's try something a little more specific. So suppose you start with sharp, and then sharp acquires a name. And then you shift it, and the name goes over here onto sharp. And then it's self-referring. So sharp stands for the operation that you do of uh, shifting, the shifting operation itself. If that system that you are becomes cognizant of its own shifting operation, it acquires a name for itself. That is, it requires a self-reference. So, um, so you don't have to start with self-reference. You don't have to start with the loopiness. The loopiness will happen, no, whether you like it or not, um, if the system is sufficiently complex. Does that give a rise to the uh, sense of self? I have no idea. I don't think this is, this is far too skeletal to talk about the sense of self in relation to this, but it says something. Um, and it's also exactly what happens um, in some situations that are very, very well known in logic. You see, you could start with, with something that talks about the shifting operation, and then that acquires a name. Let's call it G. And then you shift that, and then this thing that was talking about the shifting operation is talking about its own name. So if you had a language that has the shifting and has the naming, then the entities in that language that can talk about the shifting operation can end up talking about their own names. That is, they get shifted into entities that talk about their own names. And that's how Gödel's theorem gets proved, where the sentences are sentences like, there is no proof of, the pro of this proposition. There is no proof of proposition 35, but proposition 35 turns out to be this one right here, the one that was talking. Those, 
those fixed points happen. So, um, so, so this is how you can't not have reflexivity if the, if the system is sufficiently rich. What I didn't talk about was a shift on this of asking, what do you mean by a system being reflective, reflexive? We've been talking all this time about reflexivity by sort of jumping into it and giving examples of one thing or another being reflexive. But I wanted to offer a definition of what I mean by a reflexive, a reflexive space or a reflexive system. The definition is simple enough. Um, so I'll try it out on you but I won't try to do a whole lot more slides. So, so I want to call uh, a space, I'll say a space, but you can think system. Um, I want to call a, a space reflexive if every entity there is also a transformation of it. And every transformation of it is also an entity. That there should be no difference between the nouns and the verbs. These are not easy things to make mathematically. We saw small examples. You can also try to make large examples. But if you have, if you have a situation that where every entity is actually also um, um, a transformation of the system, then you have a kind of pure reflexive situation. And you can see how that definition um, corresponds to reflexivities in actual practice. For example, just to give an example, if you have a programming language in which every um, time you make a program, you can make a word in the language that corresponds to that program, and the words in the language are the entities, then that's reflexive. There are programming languages where you can do that, or partially. Um, and then, um, then you can think of the system as acting on itself by producing new, new, new words in the language, or you can think of someone acting in regard to it um, and letting it grow in that way. And if you have a situation like that, then um, all this kind of phenomena happens quite naturally in it. So we could go on uh, with more examples, but we have to stop. So I'm going to stop.